just make this simple and do a one, two count? Is that okay? One, two, one, two. Are you participating? One, two. Does that sound good? One's over here, two's over there. So the first question which you all have is, um, what does cultural heritage mean to you? And dis disregard the in this neighborhood, because the sense has explained it's a citywide initiative. So buildings, businesses, events, something else. So start yelling out. And yeah, I mean, certainly hearing from Bertie Bob Watt about Ringo Alley and then reading an article a while later that it was going to be commemorated. I almost was like, well, gosh, in any way that you could maybe share that story with somebody coming to visit it, or somebody who's stumbling on it uh, by mistake, or somebody who a guidebook is pointing it out to. I mean, boy, I, I staying in Paris and having guidebooks in our rental and everything, and just reading all those and the, the great shield plaques that they have, you know, even though they're in French, and, you know, <laughs> but it just enriches the experience so much for me to be where a thing that I've been curious about or studied or you know, to, to actually uh, be there is important. So all those things that I see thus far in San Francisco and the idea of making it more so, I mean, the fact that Harvey Milk's camera shop was, you know, numbered 575 and it's the same, you know, address as the Hypnodrome uh, uh, had been, you know, on 10th Street, had uh, that not been marked as being his store, I never would have known, never would have made the connection. And uh, so I'm all for enriching people's experience of San Francisco through recognition of things like this. But with the Ringgold Alley, didn't they just totally renovate it? It's like a little mini park now? Ringgold Alley, it, it, right? It is, not, it is not existent as it was. Yeah, it's totally yeah. transformed. Name, Are they done? Only in name. It's been a project? I think they're still continuing as one of the They've started laying in those well, that would, be, that would be that would be when we become memory. obstructionists yeah. if we care about actually, you know, preserving what the thing so is. So they put the French shield there, and the tourists uh, uh, on the side of a condo. This is where a lot of sex happened in alleys, right? So I think that's one of the points is that we're getting is that like cultural heritage, first of all, includes documentation and research from the past, but it also includes, to me, preservation and sustenance of what we have or what we've lost. I don't think it actually goes with development, but it should be able to lend a voice to that, a voice of knowledge and a voice of history. Um, and so for San Francisco cultural heritage, we have very good history of documenting and it's getting better. So like my answer to the bigger center will be yes, of course. Um, but I, I see it failing in the last five to 10 years in preserving and especially in sustaining. Um, and just to reiterate what I said before, I think our problem is you can always like preserve the culture, but if we don't have a community that actually lives here to enjoy it, then it's like the people that say, why go to the Castro if it's just tourists that go to see some things that aren't there anymore. We have, we have Harvey Milk's camera shop, but that's preserving something of huge historic value, not just cultural, also historic. But we, we're losing spaces every month. At the, at the corner of Moscone Center, the back of Moscone South, at Folsom and uh, Third, there's a little plaque honoring a Greek community that used to be there. And it's so lonely and so decontextualized <coughs> that that to me is, I mean, I'm sure the people who had to fight to get it there, but it doesn't seem to work. There's, there's nothing there. There's nothing in the design. It's just, it's, it's forlorn. I, and I think that's an example of failed plaque, plaquery. Well, how about a uh, standardized signage, like in Vermont, where it's brown and tan, you know, everything. Everything that's historic. And it could be uh, like the, the historic district signs. Well, yeah, um, when I'm thinking about like this open-ended question, what does cultural heritage mean to you? I, um, I think of my own history. I mean, I'm of a certain age. Um, so I go back far enough that I, in, in this neighborhood even, uh, 
that I remember places that are not there anymore uh, that are, for me, represented the community. You know, so for me, what does cultural heritage mean? What is community? What was community back then? And what did that? What shape did that? What heart and spirit did that community uh, um, form and share amongst each other? And uh, I think that becomes cultural heritage when it's sort of passed on to other people, you know, and when we sort of like uh, adopt those values uh, that were uh, formed uh, in that earlier time. And so for me, I came of age in the 1980s. I moved to San Francisco in 1981, um, you know, right when the first reports were coming out of uh, HIV. And so those were my formative years in San Francisco. Um, and uh, I think of the, the, the bars that I went to. I mean, Badlands is still here, you know, uh, right next door. Um, that was my first bar. Was it for Badlands? Badlands. Yeah, it's a, it's a, when there were license plates on the walls. Yeah. yeah. The pool table. Exactly. <laughs> the pool table. I, know. Yeah. I would go in there to shoot pool. You mean they're not still there? <laughs> <laughs> I have not been there since it changed to owners. Yeah. Many years ago. <laughs> But uh, I walked past every day, and it would make me sad if it was gone. I guess, or you know, if it, I don't know. I know it's different, but you know, uh, MCC. I was very sad to see MCC close, even though I'm not religious. But uh, I used to go there for ACT UP meetings and everything, um, and a lot of other community organizing meetings uh, we'd go to that started there. And so when it was sold to be torn down to turn into some condos up here on Eureka Street. It's just a real loss to me that, you know, um, I mean, it, it couldn't be used because there was some uh, structural damage from Loma Prieta and, uh, you know. Well, it sounds like there's two things. One, I'm attempting uh, to identify and preserve existing buildings and then also marking buildings that are either not there or are serving a different use. And so whether it's a guidebook or a plaque um, or an app or, uh, but to somehow, because what, what, uh, what would we tell someone who's never been to San Francisco about the important LGBT places? So we've, we've got our personal memories, but what, what would we want to transmit to Someone, either a young gay person coming to the or straight people. Well, I have an idea. Go for it. Um, next year will be the 40th anniversary of Harvey Milk's legislation, the Pooper Scooper Law. And I live near DeBose Park, and that's where he had that famous photo op. And there's zero commemoration or about that. So you have a big poop in. Yeah, poop in. Yeah. But, but next year's uh, the 40th anniversary of a lot of things. Yeah. Huh? Uh, next year's the 40th anniversary of a lot of things, but oh. that's an interesting okay. one to bring And it's up, just yeah. connected to the Harvey Milk uh, photo labs just up the hill, so yeah. it'd be great to have more continuity. Yeah. And, and also that connects us to another organized community, which is the dog owners, who are a political group in the city. No, I mean, it's, not <laughs> it's, a, it's not only a demographic group, I mean, it's a political group with its political action and everything. And what I was thinking of is like, for instance, you mentioned MCC as a place where we meet. There were a lot of meetings, for instance, that I remember in Swedish American Hall. And that's another place, so I think one of the, th which, like the thing with the dog owners, is I think we need to get the intersection of our historic places with other groups' historic places and not make it seem exclusive, <laughs> rather more cooperative, which... Okay, I can have, may I add to that? Yeah. So to make a more cooperative and uh, multicultural type of space with uh, DeBose Park, with the uh, recognition of the Cooper's Cooper Law, instead of like a statue of Harvey Milk, maybe a statue of his dog. The dog is noted in uh, his autobiography, I can't remember the dog's name now, but we, we don't well, have anything like that. Let's not get bogged down in specific yeah. markers, but let's <laughs> get general. But so, these are all great okay. ideas and what we'll get to But the thing about Swedish American Hall is it's also a symbol of the cultural succession that went from Norwegian to 
Irish and Italian to gay exiles, lesbian and gay exiles from around the country. But also, in terms of our own history of LGBT communities, is the ecological succession of a series of gay neighborhoods, uh, starting with the waterfront and the Tenderloin and Polk Street and North Beach and North and Beach Market. Yeah, yeah. So we could list a dozen neighborhoods, some of which might still be in existence and some might not. That's why I was motivated to do this. Yeah. But um, yeah, so different. But I love your idea of cross pollination. So it's not just queer spaces; it's queer and dog spaces, or queer and, and it's a city we share all of right. I mean, even the Castro, at its height of being ghetto ground zero, and with cruising 100 percent of the time everywhere, was still this major transit intersection that whole bunches of people elsewhere in the city were walking through and marching through, you know, and like, so that there's always been that kind of sharing our spaces and our communities with other, with other groups. Well, okay, so, um, I, what a, the, the thing about places and districts and all that is, is, is really awesome and, and important. And things are changing, and stuff is getting torn down, and things are being built up. And I think that we can try to slow the process in some important places, um, and certainly protect certain, some places. But it is a process, and it does continue. And uh, and I think the important thing that I want to highlight, though, is the stories. Um, how do we, you know, because. Even if we protect a place and we put a plaque on it and it changes owners and it changes use, what about how are we capturing and, and conveying the stories that, of the people who were there um, and uh, conveying those to uh, not just passers by but uh, the broader community, especially young people, young queer people on that one. So that's kind of the, the question for me, and I have a lot of ideas about that. Um, and I think apps are one way um, that is kind of like, um, uh, um, that can, you know, uh, transmit to a lot of people. Um, you know, Cleve Jones participates in this one walking tour where you can download an app and um, take a tour of the Castro with Cleve. Um, is that the detour? Yes. Uh -huh. I see people using that. Yeah, and they come in here also, and so, um, that's one way. Um, a museum, I think we're going to get to talking about later. Obviously, here we're able to t tell stories that are not specific to this place, but are, are about many different communities and intersections of different communities and different places. So, um, but I just want to you know, make a pitch for telling stories. Like Russell has told stories for so many years. <laughs> well, one of the things uh, that the Historical Society is doing is re reimagining its oral history project. So then we will have people telling their stories, and those can be used in a variety of different ways. So, um, yeah, because there's a million stories. One idea I had was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Shimon Ati, but he takes uh, images of, let's say, Jewish um, storefronts that are no longer there and projects them, the archival picture, onto the, the current facade. So suddenly, they're there again, 50 years later, or 100 years later. And so that seems like um, an interesting way to, to commemorate you know, as an art piece or as a walking tour. That's interesting. I, I hear a lot of people, I'm sorry I'm talking too much, but I hear a lot of people talk about uh, remembering, the, uh, See soon. remembering the worst of the AIDS years. Um, and uh, the thing I hear people say most often is that um, well, I don't go to the Castro anymore because there's so many ghosts. Um, I hear that over and over again. There's so many ghosts, you know. And I don't know if people mean that literally or just like there's... Yes, from assaults. There was a violent murder across from where I lived two years ago. Or from assaults, uh, whatever. I mean, I guess the longer you live, the more there's going to be like uh, people that have passed on from any number of things. But um, that's an interesting idea. What if we like embrace that and like try to show this uh, the people um, in the place? You know? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. 
a virtual reality app would let you look at what it used to look like. So I think when we're getting on that place, well, in a little bit, when you're talking about things or young queers or people visiting or straights or whatnot, like I can't speak for all the millennials, but people want interactive events. Site, sites are what we need to have, but they will go to them on Instagram, not in person. Mm -hmm. um, like popping ideas, like things like there are plenty of documentaries about things in San Francisco history and cultural. Why isn't that showing at Castro Theater once a month? Why don't we have those where it's actually open to the public and that type of event style where it is cultural heritage, but it's made more public? I think a large museum and system could do that, but it's also why isn't there aren't there public showings at like the GOBT Society uh, Center now that they've expanded and renovated. Um, but things like the, the walking app, a VR app, you, you need to look at event style things that are either individual and uh, manipulatable for the individual mm -hmm. that want or actual recurring things that get like tra attraction with them early on from the city and from nonprofits. So a variety of approaches. Like three or four of them, yeah, you need to, sh like there needs to be options, but not more than this. Like, I, what what's the point of any of these? If I see twelve things, I'm probably not going to do it. If I have a choice of four or five, it's going to be there. Say, so I I normally don't speak up in these things, but uh, to expand on your idea, I think it'd be nice to have an interactive map that you could expand if it was a Castro anywhere in the city. And then when you click on an address, it shows you the location from years ago, photographs maybe of inside, and maybe a dialogue or somebody speaking. And you can actually put them in locations as people travel uh, around. They could you know, click and see what's close to them. But it would give them access not only to what the current view is, but the historical and the people and everything. It would be interactive and somebody coming to visit the city. Uh, you could actually work with commission. Google to pilot that on Google it's Maps already, during Pride. It already exists. It's a great idea. It just needs to be developed. It's something that yeah. uh, Shane has been spearheading. I was going to mention History Pin is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's so exactly what I'm referring to. You can upload videos onto that and you know, see what, you know, what was around your house many years ago. And it's crowdsourcing and anyone can upload photos to it. And, um, and spend hours on that, but that has different thematic kind of pages, and they have a pride one, so um, something like that is quite fascinating. There's also allies, um, which are viewers that are like binocular type viewers that you can look into and are used for different visualization um, exercises, and they're placed at locations, like they're doing one on the SF waterfront, for example, um, for sea level rise, but you can use it for historical purposes to see what, um, what used to be in a certain place. Um, so that is kind of a fun thing that can get you know, some uh, foot traffic. And, and you talking about like a virtual reality headset kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, it's like one of the, like, you know, at historical sites where there's binoculars, it's similar to that, but you just view what um, the area was like historically. I don't know, maybe start with a map of sorts uh, across time. Uh, um, uh, to see who's here and, and, and who is here, who, who should, you know, who, who are we representing, who are we, who are we forgetting about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always going to be about, you know, whoever is loudest or, or uh, you know, in history, whoever is widest, you know. So um, we have to not do it that way anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to um, not respond, but just sort of like uh, talk a little bit about what you said which is that um, it's interesting with this, this event because we're talking about San Francisco in a general manner and in previous conversations or previous um, events that have been hosted by different groups, it's been more neighborhood focused, which I think also narrows um, the conversation down a little bit. But there hasn't, to my knowledge, yet been one that really takes it to a cultural level. So like, for example, like the African-American LGBT community, like I don't think there, there hasn't yet been a group answering these questions from that specific perspective. And maybe those are things that we can also look at, you know, from a women's community, you know, you know, all these different things, trans, 
Um, I know that the Compton's like the Compton district. We started our own community process, um, not not exactly linked to this, but asking ourselves some of these questions. And I think that we would also want to contribute to this conversation as well. Um, so thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate what you said too. And so part of the work we've done at the Historical Society is also to constantly interrogate ourselves about who's missing. What's missing? What aren't we seeing? What do we not even have any evidence for? Whose voices have we not heard that we can recognize that we're not that we're not hearing them exactly? So, for example, poor people, homeless people, people with disabilities. We can start going down a long list. We know those experiences are there, and that there are LGBTQ experiences there. How can we find some way to hear those voices? And to, if there are people who have those voices, to empower them or to find sources in the past so that it isn't a story of a bunch of middle class white gay guys came to San Francisco and set up a theme park. Uh, which is you know, not a very interesting <laughs> history. <laughs> Pretty boring. I'm Dane Johnston, and um, what I'm going to do is kind of explain the story, the stories about me, and I end up being kind of the proof of, of how really infested from my eyes the city is with, with prejudice for, uh, for homeless and how much damage it does for me. And, and, and uh, I was, when I got here, if anyone knows from a long time ago, a famous character before they ever called me a hero, um, just for things I say out there and whatever I do, tell jokes or whatever I do. And, and I was also famously honest. And I was up here in the world, and I did nothing to lower myself. I didn't taint my honesty at one bit. And, but everywhere I go, they treat me like a thief. And so many people see me being treated like a thief, and all the other people are thieves. That I basically now, at this point in my life, I'm in a, like a, a virtual worthlessness. Like, I tell people I'm a hero. I tell people I clean Twin Peaks all the time. Could you give me a piece of bread? And all day, no one will give me a piece of bread. And, and, it's, and, and people are looking at me and treating me this way and that way. And so I'm the proof because I did not change from my height up here. And here I am down here. And I want to be risen back up here. And I want all these people that are falsely you know, down here risen back up here. And I would like to be included as a, as a, you know, as a minority, finally be called a minority, have a written you know, uh, economic status and have, you know, have a contingent in the gay parade. And I'm gonna be in charge of that. <laughs> And I want, I, want, I want to have a plaque on the sidewalk that says, the homeless people, you know. I want people to know that I clean Twin Peaks. I've been cleaning it for 25 years, right? And then I come down here and I have a problem because I'm a worthless piece of trash to everybody, okay? So no one will give me anything to eat. And I've already spent half a day cleaning people's trash. And I've been doing this a while trying to get, I'm on, I'm on YouTube and stuff. And you want to go to, if you want to donate to me at all, or you got any ideas, is go to handup.org. Uh, you can donate to me and then they give me a food card. It's kind of hard for me to do it other than just buy food with it. And I really don't eat enough food, you know. I'm like two or three Great Danes is how I eat. And, and uh, so, you know, uh, people are, are able to, and there needs to be, everyone that has a job dealing with the public has to have de-escalation training. They just sit there and escalate crazy homeless people like candy, like they don't care because they fucking hate homeless people. It's not, and no one cares, although, and people have to care. People have to care to see somebody hating a homeless person. Say, why are you hating that homeless person? You have to care. And I'm a gay person, so I've come with, as a gay people saying, why can't you include me? What? Dane. Yeah, thanks for listening. And I'm trying to get that message out, and trying to get a message out, and the message of, of feed me more, because I, I put in over 50 hours a month up there, and at 10 bucks an hour, uh, that's that's uh, five hundred dollars worth of work. I'm not even, I'm not asking for five hundred dollars of donations, but you guys give me some donations and feed me, you know, because you guys you guys are cruel. You should. You know, I'm a worthless piece of shit. I mean, think about it. You know, I didn't do shit to deserve that. And fucking think about what that does. Now you're okay because most of them are bad. I know. I know. You're on the side. I gotta go. Okay. Thank Sorry. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. A lot. Well handled. Thank you. I actually remember him from Park Street some years ago. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> he was a very good looking. He has been a career community <laughs> member for as long as I've been in town. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a lot there, actually. Yes. In fact. Yeah. Right in your name. And folks, maybe just know there's one historian associated with the Historical Society, Joy Plaster, is actually doing a PhD at Yale on 
queer homelessness in the Tenderloin and the history of queer homelessness in the Tenderloin, and has been doing a lot of work on that issue over the last 10, 15 years. So uh, there are really good work, really, really, really good scholarship, good scholarship, and really engaged around the social justice implications of the work. So that's I'm, so I'm really glad that one of those voices I was like, we never get to hear them. Thank you, Dane Kane. Yeah. Gave us that voice. Um, it, well, it should be centered back on the question again. So basically, we're looking at some specifics on how we preserve this, that history. So, um, do you feel the community and its history have been represented? If not, how? I want to echo what Gerard was saying that it's so important to have a multitude of stories and a multitude of communities represented. And, and that's been, again, one of the things about the historical society. I wrote for the first thing was, thank goodness for the GOBG's historical society. And I don't know that that many people know how it actually started, that it was rejected by the public historian at the time. And so that's why we formed our own. I wasn't one of the founding members. I came in uh, later. but. They actually met with her and she said no, she wasn't going to take any of the queer stuff. And so that's why the GLBT Historical Society actually started. And thank goodness that there were people that cared enough to say, well, you're rejecting us and you're saying our stuff doesn't matter, but we feel that it does. And thank goodness they started saving it and formed it a group. Um, the San Francisco Gay History... Lesbian and Gay History Project. Lesbian and Gay History Project. Right, so basically, I, 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 for me the question has sort of two answers, yes and no. Are we being well represented? Yes. And are we being well represented? No. <laughs> no is around all those questions of things like social justice struggles within our own community. Have we done a good enough job of looking at the history of that and, and really activating that, of continuing to interrogate ourselves and find those missing voices and lost experiences, right down to the level of those lost queer experiences of the individuals or couples or individual sexual acts that were basically disconnected entirely from queer culture but also are part of that experience uh, in, in the past and even in the present. So there's things there to be done. But the other piece is the way it's been done well, so well that it's almost become invisible, is that in San Francisco going back to the 1950s, we've had people here who loved LGBTQ history and who said, do we have a past? Can we find a past for ourselves? Most of us learn about the past initially from our biological families, our grandparents, family albums. Uh, we learn it in school or our churches. Well, queer folk don't get our past there. So some amazing LGBTQ people early on in the city started asking those questions, looking for ways to find a past and share it in the Mattachine Review and the Daughters of Belitis' magazine, The Ladder. And uh, in 1978, the San Francisco Lesbian and Gay History Project which gave birth to this organization. So for 40 years, we've had a network, an intergenerational, multicultural network of crazed LGBTQ history lovers that have institutionalized that love in our city. But that network and the resources that made it possible are fragile, are inadequate. So that's another case where we've done a great job and we also need a lot more resources, a lot more support, a lot more institutional city policy funding, etc., etc., to make sure that the places like this don't vanish, uh, particularly in a city where managing to survive at all as a nonprofit and do anything that's about making meaning instead of making money is under extreme threat. So I think this process might help us kind of identify some of those resources that need to be propped up and, and uh, strengthened and enriched as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm mainly just listening, um, but a lot of the things have, uh, have been mentioned, or we're kind of going through the same process with Gaiden Pato, and where we actually didn't have a uh, you know, historical society until about two years ago. Um, <clears throat> and that's then the <clears throat> Excuse me, instead of the writing a historic context statement, I wrote the mills in San Francisco. Um, and it's a very long process because you know, they're the first ones who are trying to compile all the information together. Um, and it's, it's, it's challenging um, for me doing my job there 
because though I may know certain pieces of history, I don't have, I didn't, you know, it's not a, it's not a novel or a book or a textbook on a penal history in San Francisco. Um, and if there is, if there is, if there is a written documentation, it's going to be, um, it's going to be scholarly works. So it's not very easily accessible, it's not very easily read by a lay person. Um, and so now we're seeing that we need to really compile to understand our history to point out why it's important, why it's special, and why these these little events, these, these events that occurred were really powerful and were really um, kind of like fulcrums for, for people. Um, so we recently, uh, a good uh, example is um, they institute these red bus lanes on Mission Street, and they've really, really hurt businesses, businesses on Mission Street um, for the past year now. And it's unlikely that they're ever going to go away. Um, so MTA, as like a sign of goodwill, said we're going to do, we'll do a marketing campaign with you. And a marketing campaign kicked off a couple weeks ago, and it was a low rider cruise down Mission Street. So. Yeah, from from six to nine, it was just like Mission Street was what it was in the seventies. I mean, even in the eighties and part of the nineties, it was just like teeming with people. The streets teeming with people. These beautiful cars that were like that people have such um, um, such pride in. Yeah, thank you. Um, and they're beautiful, right? And it's just fun to see them going up down the street and to see all these brown faces on the street like like how you used to. Um, and um, and I want to take that, we're going to do, we'll do it again in July. And I kind of want to do it every three months. Um, so we kind of have this big event that brings folks back and have left. Um, I think we have here, we have Pride, where we have um, you know, Dyke March, we have all these events that bring folks back to their, to their home essentially. Um, and with all this place, 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 place in the Latinos in San Francisco, we have to have these events to bring folks back. Um, but there's also really fun parts of history to tell from lowriders. You get to, to tell the history of Dianne Feinstein <laughs> against the lowriders. Um, you know, which like, is such this, it's such this, it's such a great story that just needs to be documentary. Can't um, wait to hear more. Right? right? Like, I just think... I, One more chapter in Diane Feinstein versus something more. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but it's, it's, those, it's those little things where it's like, people wouldn't, you know, people wouldn't know. I think if, if you aren't already... If you don't already care about history, you don't care about that moment. Or was, it's, not, it's not, even, not even on your, like, you know... It's, it's not anywhere near what you care about, or what even comes to you as information, and so... But um, where would you have heard about it? Where yeah. Where would you have learned about it? Right, I, I mean, I learned about this stuff through just, I don't know, like, it's like word of mouth, really. And, you know, as, as elders, are, as our elders are passing away, it's, those stories just aren't going to get told anymore. So we need to be able to capture those, um, and compile them together in a way that's digestible to people. So whether that's making, you know, 15, 20, 30 minute documentary about these things. Um, uh, so like so those to me are like how do we kind of all pull those things together. I'm like, oh we need this really strong base of scholarly work that the folks have done and then make it and then kind of translate it, transform it into really digestible material for people. Um, for them to take pride in stuff. And so I think it's such how does um, you know, uh, Army Street was named Sa Chavez in like ninety seven. I think a year later, folks in Noe Valley did a campaign to rename Chavez back to Army. Um, it was on a ballot in San Francisco. You know, it's like those kinds of things. Where it's like, oh right, these 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 places didn't just happen. Someone had to put effort into making this happen. Um, and I think that's empowering for people to understand that oh, a group of people came together um, and decided to you know start this venture and then. Yeah. The center came out of it. So. I um, I want to actually build off of the, sort of this um, theme of pride and sort of um, I'm wondering if there is something that would make us proud to see within you know our LGBT neighborhoods or um, spaces or places. Um, 
like if, if there were people in our lives that we wanted to teach about GLBT history, where we would take them, um, or what we would show them, and what would make us proud to show these people, um, sort of in the same way as like you know taking them to an event where they had this amazing event where these little writers you know drove down the street and people were able to congregate and you know kind of harkened back to the old school mission. Um, or there things like that about with GLBT neighborhoods that um, would give us pride, you know, make us feel that way. I think, like you said, a map really just be able to pinpoint those places, right? It's like all lesbian books stops that used to be on Valencia, um, but that was such a powerful place to congregate. It was fun. That? It was fun. <laughs> All the bookstores and the women's baths and the restaurants and all that. Right, so there's probably thinking of ways to how, what, what media are possible to bring that information to people beyond an actual carry it around map or guidebook, which I love. I think those are things we need. It's shocking that there's no queer historic sites guidebook to San Francisco. Uh, a, a, a fellow colleague visiting from Prague just brought me a copy of the Popular guidebook to the LGBTQ historic sites in Prague. I mean, come on, let's get with it. Let's get with it. Let's get with the picture here. I've got one from Munich. I mean, it's like, hello, are we? Wow. Yeah, it's like, you'd think we could kind of catch up with the sort of most rudimentary aspects of. And New York has just launched a website of queer historic sites. So, same thing, that would be handy because you can take it around and look at it on your phone. And it'd be really fantastic to have sort of. GPS enabled virtual plaques mm -hmm. that you could just, wherever you are, just. Yeah, I've always wanted to do one for three Have your phone tell you, you are near this important LGBTQ site or this site with this interesting story. That's already. Kind of. So, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Don Roxburgh. Oh, yeah. And he's developing the, he was in the process of developing a, like an augmented reality app for his um, homo history hunt. <laughs> And that might be something that he's looking to finish in the near future. Absolutely. But yeah, using like augmented reality to, oh, I'm in front of Harvey Mel's right. camera shop. So you can how it looked back then. Yeah. Exactly. So making it interactive, but also modern. Right. Yeah, it would be easy to expand on your idea to have a map that would be expandable like the Castro. You click on a location. Not only did you, do you have a drop down that shows photos, but people talking about it and a little written history. So if you're traveling somewhere, you just expand on your area and say, what LGBT, or do a search for a particular thing. I'd like to add that the other old school thing that we need is we need historic plaques. People are often disparage them and say, oh, but no, in fact, the fact that we don't have. They ought to be all over the place. I mean, just think, if it was such and such famous LGBTQ person slept here, there'd be a plaque on every building in San Francisco. <laughs> 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 Probably several plaques, just for one person. <laughs> so, and there it may be a question of pushing the city in coalition with some of the other cultural districts and the other groups that are working on context statements and so on. So, for example, my other hometown, Paris, the city has set it up so that there can be a plaque anywhere they want because they have these sort of cast iron spade shaped plaques on a pole and they stick them in the sidewalk in front of the building so the owner doesn't have to give the city permission. They have no say over it. The plaque is in the sidewalk but it's not down being walked on and being damaged. And so it would be possible to develop a model where we could have plaques all over the place. It was walking around. You don't even need to be looking at your phone. You see the standardized thing there and you say, oh, what was that? And it'd be great for me to have it be all the different diverse and rich communities that have made up San Francisco. You know, us queer folk might push for that, but it might be the city agreeing to adopt an actual more assertive and comprehensive marking system of plants like that to, to show the diversity of the city's A budget line item. A budget line item. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll zip off a note to my pals at Paris City Hall and ask them how the city pays for it. <laughs> yeah, they actually, they that should be have, that should be an important part of the process. Actually, the budget department. Yeah. Yes. Otherwise, it will never happen if it's not a line item. 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's actually really so good. So I'll go find out like how to, what, who's in charge and how does it get paid for there. Yeah. You know, I poke a lot of fun at plaques, but I do actually believe that they are important and are really... I read them when I see one. one. <laughs> <laughs> some people walk by them and some people stop and look. Yeah. 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 Oh, the city of Vancouver also, I was they put in there, and they have um, these plaques that they then adhere to like telephone poles. And they say, celebrate Vancouver's queer history. And they have little vignettes of like, this is this drag queen story, this is this other person's story. Um, and they have QR codes that you can scan, and I don't know what that does, but they do have them on there. Um, as well as, they actually have a light post with a red bulb that is a sex worker memorial. And that's the first sex worker memorial I've ever seen. Um, and if someone knows someone in like Vancouver City writing, they seem to be ahead of the ball on this one. Right, and another unheard voice that I imagine would be one of the voices addressed in the Compton's district. Well, that, that's a whole aspect of our mm -hmm. community that has been swept under the rug. We identify, you know, which um, you know, I mean, here we've got, I mean, Allen Ginsberg was, was a seminal figure in the Summer of Love, and, you know, I'm sure he's, I, I know he's featured in it, but he's not, like, queer-identified featured, you know, and so it's kind of like... Um, it's like Hamilton. Right. That he was bisexual, and that's not even in the storyline. Right, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, uh, a lot of race. there's a lot of examples of that, and just, like... So it is from both sides in terms of intersectionality. It's like it's from the side of you know we, we need to have inclusion in the larger narrative of San Francisco, but at the same time we need to uh, have um, diversity within our queer uh, exhibits and programs. Uh, Exactly. Should we almost be on the checklist? Like, have you included men, women in the LGBT community? Right. Well, another example is the uh, hippie modernism show at Berkeley Art Museum, which uses a picture of the cockat, a big, beautiful, colored, queer picture, and there's really not much queer content in the show. So it's, I think it's quite, Oh, yeah, it is, but it's, it's sort of false advertising. You come see more like this, and then the show itself is pretty text based. And, yeah. So, um, so what other, we were supposed to talk about... Uh, oh, we're, we're using the Ginsburg photo here to draw other people in. I mean, that's an area of intersectionality. Because mm -hmm. we know... Jenny and Joplin. And Joplin. But the, but the poster had Ginsburg on it, right? Uh, we're using both. Okay. Oh, those? Oh, those, okay. So, so you, uh, you mentioned the checklist. How would we broaden the telling of LGBTQ history? Well, there's also, you know, within the LGBTQ community, there are so many different kinds of subcultures within it that, you know, I would like to see those all represented, or, you know, in some capacity. I mean, obviously, there's gays, there's lesbians, there's transgender people, there's, you know, bears, there's um, leather people, and, you know, you know, twinks, and, you know, the list goes on and on, and sort of subcultures within it. So um, I think whatever kind of programming is done, it would, um, you know, certainly want to be as comprehensive as possible. And, you know, we can't do everything, but just showcase the, the diversity within the community. I think that's a really good point, and, uh, you know, like thinking about the subcultures and what um, what subcultures or what enclaves are not really well represented, uh, where in the city or the area even, um, are there stories that need to be told? I don't know if anybody here can think of any of this. Well, yeah, I'm thinking of like the leather community in particular. It's like, I mean, it's seen, it's just as, if you just look at that one example, it's kind of seen as, uh, sort of like a, a, a cardboard cutout of uh, you know uh, the, what, what is what is the leather community? It's like a leather daddy with a certain leather uniform on and uh, and all that. But it's in terms of its its culture, it's like uh, has subcultures within it, and it has um, uh, an amazing history around uh, uh, community and fundraising specifically around AIDS I'm thinking about, um, and just community service generally. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, includes women and, you know, um, so
So uh, that's just one example. T uh, transgender communities, of course, you know, is another example that needs to be better understood in terms of its history um, and its complexity. And, and but I think the answer is always like in the individual stories. Like one, you know, you pick one person and you tell that person's story, and, and through that, you open up the entire community's story. Or and also you give a better opportunity for people to identify, you know, because there's always something that somebody can identify with with an individual, but they're never going to identify with the the leather community, you know. So. Um, uh, so that's why I think it's about always about more than a plaque um, and more than just a, you know a pin on a map. You know. Well, I mean, we're talking about uh, telling stories. It's also who tells the story. You know, is somebody telling somebody else's story, or do we have self-representation? Um, do we find somebody to tell the story? I mean, I keep coming back to Screaming Queens because I think that's an interesting example of somebody finding an aspect of her history and then unpacking it and contextualizing it. Um, so I could su I'd like to suggest a programming. I mean, it's, like, it's not a program event, but you were talking about the uh, cardboard cutout of the uh, letter daddy thing as what other outside cultures view the gay culture as, which is a, a stereotype. Um, I would like to see more, um, when people come to the Castro, if, just when they come to Jane Warner Plaza, if there was more information about her and that that is a, um, a, a safe place for anybody. But this person happened to also be a lesbian and was a part of the community. So, because she has a nice big plaque, but uh, it's kind of a shit show most of the time. It's not being managed. Um, I, mean, it, no, I mean, it goes up and down. The park. Yeah, I think it's kind of like too bad that Harvey Mill Plaza is not seen as a whole four-corner yeah, intersection it's just project. It's not incorporating the Pink Triangle Park. Yeah. It's not incorporating the Jane Warner Plaza. It's just that one subway um, station here. Oh, you mean the sandwich place? Yeah. Right. Oh, no, the other subway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to give my own example okay. for this in, in general, and then I'm sure it branches out into other groups when they bring up subcultures and everything. Um, I'm a largely active member in the Radical Fairies, um, and there was a property that was not Radical Fairy owned, but it became known to anyone coming to the city as the Fairy House on 14th Street, owned by Marty Khan, that was just sold two years ago. Um, and we formed, as I said, an LLC, we tried to buy it back, we got bought out before market. But we spent months just doing the cultural heritage of like 25 years in that property. 18 different leather subcommunities used it for their events and their gatherings. Um, and one of the problems I see in this preservation is also moving forward is that we don't have these places to commune. I'm not talking about like community centers, I'm talking about private places that are safe and monitored to commune. And that's a history that the city is well known for not only in public cruising but in private gatherings. I'm sure there are many other communities that are not documented in any way, and Rory Cecil did a very good digital documentation of the 14th Street Hot History in a two-hour like presentation at um, one of the churches, but it took months and months after that to even start to pull that together. So there's plenty of more private gathering-style groups that want to come out, but either there's issues about how do you could that money be around around that, where is that location? <laughs> uh, 14th Street House is 415 14th Street between Valencia and Guerrero. It's already been sold. They've been yeah. So the money that was raised from that, could that organization purchase a totally different new space? Because, well, we raised 800000 and now we've so got a condo. With a 60 hour a week job, I couldn't <laughs> do that and <laughs> that. And we have 1.3 in promissory for that um, location. Mm -hmm. When we missed out through that, people, the heritage of that physical place was more important mm -hmm. to those individuals than that. So we only had about 300,000 for putting forth to a new. And we worked with San Francisco Community Land Trust, who I hope you're working with more um, in preserving and developing new uh, groups. But no, the interest there was in the specific location history. Well, yeah. we'll see something around it, but I just wanted to tag on to that. Um, I saw recently an exhibit about um, uh, Robert Duncan and 
Jess and their circle, and the home that they lived in, uh, once they were both gone, but before it was sold, uh, someone came in and took a video camera and just documented everything, the walls, what, the couch, the book collection, the... Yeah, that's exactly what Rory did so, for us, yeah. So it's not the answer, but at least, and talk about haunted, so you could see the decades of gatherings that were happening. There was no soundtrack, there was nothing, just slow pan around. So, you know, if we don't succeed at preservation, at least we can, the next step would be documentation. I was going to mention the Blue House over here on 18th Street. It was a, a refuge. Uh, I don't know much of the details of it, but 18 between near Sanchez um, um, on the south side of the street. Um, and I see people stopping. It's in someone's guidebook. But also Gavin Arthur's house in, was it in the Hain or was it north of the park? I forgot. Um, but the, actually that brings up something else. It's like there, there are, and we've talked about this, there's a, a couple of data sets. Uh, one that I believe the city has, and uh, uh, that, and one that the historical site has is larger, and we need to like merge those, and make sure that we have a complete data set of all the different identified LGBTQ sites. And, people, yeah. and, and, the, and the second thing I want to be sure to mention is that uh, one thing that our committee has been calling for is to have sort of an alert system uh, with the planning department so that when a site mm -hmm. um, is being sold that has that's on our data map uh, has historic significance for the LGBTQ community um, that uh, we have a community liaison perhaps with the historical society or others as well that are alerted so that we can you know uh, Advocate. I uh, maybe not stop that the project. Trip. Maybe not stop the project necessarily, but make sure that it's commemorated. And I have a recent example as what you're talking about is that underground a bar on Market Street, maybe about six months ago, and uh, it was a hidden bar, a gay bar at some point. Remember that? And there was a story in the paper, and I thought it was kind of cool because it was LGBT history and oh, development. So the inter no, the and interconnecting the development basements. Basement. Yeah. And whether or not the interconnecting basements were a secret tunnel or not. Yeah. Or right. Or really just the made up stories. But, but, but the development went ahead. But I well, had an LGBT yeah. history. No, there were a couple of bars. That but like, lost, the, but, yeah. the, um, the Chronicle a couple of years ago did a literary map of San Francisco. Yeah. It was an electronic map. And so some of those figures are queer. Uh, and some are not, but that's another area of intersectionality is not only with other groups that are defined by ethnicity or whatever holds the community together, in our case, you know, sexual orientation and sexual identity, but um, things like, well, the literary map of you know, so that things can be multiply flagged in terms of like, well, what kind of an interest is? What about music in San Francisco? What about dramatic San Francisco? What about painters and sculptures? What about houses of prostitution? Sure. I live in one. So there's lots of lots of ways. To live. My favorite one on that was I found out that. Um, there's a place over on Dolores where uh, Emma Goldman lived for a year or so, or less than a year. It's just sort of like, all right, Emma Goldman across the street from Dolores Park. Right, and who knew? I mean, you could walk by that house. Yeah, on, on 6th Street, and I think this is part of the new central uh, uh, Soma uh, rezoning plan that it sort of like has this gerrymandered finger that goes up 6th Street um, to Street. Mark Street. Uh, was the uh, headquarters of the Society for the Legal Rights. Sir. Yeah. Sir. Yeah, and I don't know if it's commemorated at all, but this is more like one of the seminal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a queer nightclub downstairs. So I don't even know, but uh, you know, I, that's such an important question. Is it on the list? Yeah, so I didn't find any of the context statement. And I'm not sure I have to check our list. Yeah. Anyway, but we could all think of different sites. Yeah. Well, this. So let's let's just see. Did we get to number four? Uh, 
I mean, we've gone well, how almost how we to around all. We need to get to five. We need to get to five. Have to get to five. Okay. Um, so exercise two is sort of. I think exercise two we probably don't need to do because sort of a culmination of everything that we've already talked about. But I mean, we could just. Um, I mean, how old are we? Yeah. Ever, it's probably like 20 to uh, Yes, 25 okay. to 9. Because um, we want to probably gather back together for a few minutes. But if we um, want to go through these two you know, quickly or spend more time on five. I'm sorry, I'm lost. Where oh, I'm sorry, you know, oh, that's the, that works. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, what's there? I didn't know what you were talking about. The answer to five is, of course. <laughs> well, what about the, um, at the public library, um, formal, informal uh, library, would that be included in this question? Are you on four or on five? Five? That has even the best display area than this. Yeah. And this it does? And this, oh, yeah. I mean, and, you know, as Terry frequently points out, any one of these exhibits could be a whole room in a full-size museum. Not just as it needed to tell the story, but the materials already exist in our collection. Mm -hmm. Well, if there's so much material, can they be used in like a six-month uh, pop-up shop on Castro Street in an empty rental? Working with a, a, a built property owner for a. I, I think that diverts from the main. Yeah. Need. But it'd be kind of like a mobile. It's a media lot mobile. Work. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I think that's a good thing to do, but uh, what this proposal is, is referring to is, you know, should we have a museum that is uh, embraces the full diversity of the LGBT communities? Um, and in, in a large enough space that we can adequately represent it in all its diversity. So, um, you know, comparable would be like the Contemporary Jewish Museum, um, the Mexican Museum broke ground last year, so I much larger than probably what we're even able to do for this. But so the question is, you know, in San Francisco, um, with all our history and culture, should we have a museum, not just a museum, but a research center? Uh, because the real estate is so expensive, and uh, the museum would like around 20,000 square feet, wasn't that the estimate? Maybe if there was like a, like a smaller space like this, um, but with a larger, like a warehouse in Modesto, you know, something like that. Well, I so, they'd be, so it could get much larger, like Moffett Field at Google. I don't know. Well, one of the things we've been talking about is the, the uh, cross-pollination of other groups. And it seems like uh, some of you mentioned San Francisco History Day. So the Historical Society had a booth, and the Camel Card had a booth, and the Greeks had a booth, and the Irish. And so what about, not instead of, but in addition to, a citywide museum with representation of queer yeah. culture? Um, just as a queer museum would have representation of diverse cultures. So I think everything that we say is kind of both and. It's right. not just this or just that. It's, yeah. Yeah. But the Citywide Museum, History Museum, has been installed on the runway. But now San, uh, San Francisco Museum and Historical Society is not running it, it's the California Historical Society, so there's hope. Yeah, so they've got the mint and they have uh, a lot of fundraising to do to try to uh, uh, retrofit it and, and build it out. But, you know, there's always a possibility that we could share space there. Um, another uh, possibility that uh, we could look at with the city specifically is just to look at what unused city-owned properties other than the mint there are around the city. Um, and. Um, look at, you know, what are the plans for those unused properties and can we incorporate something in there. I'm thinking that, what's it called, that there's a, um, the school right at City Hall, that shuttered school. Oh, right. The blind for the blind? No. The hall is the school. Where the North Island Oh, the high school district building. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but there, it's going through some changes right now. I thought, is aren't there school district offices in there? They're doing some performances now. It was 135 in this. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, but there's a lot of other properties. Well, and what about the community center? Is there 
room for exhibits there. We talked about that are, years and years ago. I think they're going to be doing some art exhibits. Yeah, they're, they're going to be small and they're going to be rotating. I, I, I think you are right saying, like, yes, the, the city museum needs to have an LGBT presence, but I think we've talked enough about there are so many different subcultures that are not represented and get little spaces because we don't have enough space. Like, you could do an entire, this whole thing filled about leather and full Yeah. You yeah. usually could, but. To okay, say that we, we I, I think we deserve a full scale. Yeah, not part of You know, I, I think it's okay for us. To, us it's okay for us to claim that we um, need and deserve to have a space. And I think that there's value also in having a, a, a queer specific space because um, I think that builds. Uh, community and it, it also gives people an opportunity to explore intersectionality within our community and outside our community. So how with tourism and just you know, development in general. I mean I wonder with all the new development that's happening and um, displacing some of the long term queer establishments if there's any mitigation funding for many of that that could possibly be funneled into a worthy project. Yeah that's a good question too. Mitigation funding. <laughs> it all has to go like, to rent. Well, uh, like with the CBD, the Community Benefits District, they receive money based on what's it, uh, property taxes yeah. and retail sales. I'm, but they're they're guaranteed X amount of money. So we have about five minutes. Um, is there anything important that we want our note takers to capture <clears throat> before we meet up with the other group? Did we? Um, let's just look at number four quickly. Uh, how can the city assist the community in identifying projects, procedures, programs, and techniques to preserve and promote LGBTQ cultural heritage? Uh, 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 today, walking here, I noticed that uh, the new art gallery, Art Attack, they just opened a couple weeks ago. Today, they painted a really nice mural, and it's right on Market Street, and I appreciate that. I gave the gallery owner a thumbs up as I walked by. So that's contemporary culture. So the question is, how can the city assist the community? Um, um, and the other way to frame that is, how can the community assist the city? I mean, how can we strengthen the communication or establish communication? Yeah, well, with these kinds of things, with these kinds of reports and task forces, um, what I often worry about, having participated in them before, um, first of all, expectations, you know, in terms of what's going to be produced, uh, I think it's all part of a process, and a big part of what we're doing is, is the process, you know, um, the journey to destination kind of thing. Um, but uh, implementation, I think, is going to be key. Like, uh, if we have recommendations, how do we, how do we um, uh, assign uh, city and community liaisons to perpetuate the uh, follow-up? You know. Um, yeah, so. especially when there's so many groups, uh, some constituency to think about. I mean, so. But, but specifically on this one, if if we have maps of identified things like Swedish American Hall is important to these three groups, or these seven groups or whatever, that whenever permits or projects come into the city for that, <coughs> someone from each one of those seven constituencies should get notified. And that's just a question of software. Or, uh, as well as public notice going to the established community. So if, if, if the planning department didn't know that, uh, you know, because of long, short institutional memory, that in this neighborhood that you not only should identify you not only need to notify the LGBT community, you need to notify the Scandinavian American community as well. Um, and as we were saying, that those two communities are not mutually exclusive. No. 
No, you don't nor, need to nor do the it. use of their institutions. You don't need to do like the Swedish deli or Fanella's baths. I don't need to notify them both. You just notify the Scandinavian queries and then it takes right. care of both. Right. <laughs> what were you um, yeah, I was just thinking, I wonder if there's a way to facilitate um, like a connection between um, like researchers. Uh, maybe in schools or local programs, and, and trying to harness that information. Uh, and get it doc I mean, documented, but kind of get it um, logged with the, re the rest of, of the um, location specific info. So I guess that would like be somehow like tying it to the city's um, database or the GLBT history. Database. That's a good grant right there. I think. Yeah. And what what are those programs, or you know, who's doing that research? What students? Even, um, how to tap into that? Yeah, that's a that's a really good project at the Home Health Center and the Historic Society because there's researchers working on all kinds of interesting, important projects. We all uh, learn something. I, I always learn a bunch of information about different historical uh, events and things that I had no idea about that existed in San Francisco. Um, so I was wondering if we could all as a group share some of those things that we learned today. Um, and also, um, if there were any suggestions you had for this process, things that, um, things that worked or things that didn't work or that you thought could go better, or things that um, you feel should be included the next time we um, perform this process. About how the Dyke March had to change routes recently, and that was very upsetting because a lot of people have been marching on the same route for so long. And, um, and then there's this idea of establishing National Park Service Heritage trails, or um, what are they? You work for the Park Service. What are they called? You know, the it's a trail instead of a site or a park. Do you know which heritage trails are? Yeah. So we we talked about the possibility of making establishing these routes as some sort of official designated trail, especially places like Market Street, because if you think about all of the many layers of history of marching and parading down Market Street, you know, ha happy times, sad times, really pissed off times. Um, so, yeah, so I love the idea of the dark dike march, especially because you said a business owner was the one who basically said you need to change this route. And Things that can solve for businesses. Yeah. yeah. Uh, walking tours, um, history, and using uh, media, um, an app, you know, walking tour apps. And about uh, associating stories. Uh, with points on maps and you know building on the work that's already happening in that area. Um, I, when I think about cultural heritage, I often think about uh, and museums that think about the past. Uh, but I am a person living in the present, so I'm interested in current culture making. So I'd like to see uh, more uh, art and uh, events. The questions were kind of generic and heavily couched in planning speak, which is not necessarily the language of the public, even people who are interested in these issues. Um, and that having an example of two of the kinds of things you meant would have been clear, because I kept on thinking, well, wait a minute, didn't we just discuss that? And then we got on the next question. I'm like, well, how is that different from what we just discussed? And it seemed like the four questions were four different ways of asking the same question. I think examples would be really helpful. I mean, you mentioned a couple at the beginning, like I think the Filipino and the Latina and um, some other um, existing programs in the city and perhaps, you know, an intro presentation that shows what's worked, what have they done there, what are the tools they've used. Um, that might be really inspiring when we think about um, these questions. One thing I wanted to say that was positive about this was sort of the brainstorming aspect where, I mean, I could sit at home and pull this out, but people would suggest one thing that would make me think of something else, and then somebody would bounce off that. So I felt like we built uh, from all the various sources of input, so I thought that was very helpful. One comment that I thought really jump-started um, discussion and dialogue uh, in the group out here was uh, related to really thinking about all of the various subcultures in the LGBT community. And I mean, that really got my brain going. 
Um, and then what are the stories of those subcultures? And We would like to see a arts, cultural, heritage type center um, built somewhere, or repurposed from somewhere in the city and where we could all hang out and do things and have our arts and our culture and performances and exhibit <laughs> space and <coughs> maybe the archive there and just have it be a great drop-in center. Sort of major, internationally recognized, queer public history, arts, and culture center, that it came out of a deep concern that our arts and culture are under extreme threat and extreme risk because of displacement and gentrification, that the resources that we take for granted about our history, the archives, the museum, that they are similarly, although seemingly permanent, are highly fragile in the current environment and that it might be time for us all to sort of throw in our lot together and see if there's some way to get city major philanthropists and developers to step up and say, can we preserve our history and our arts and culture, perhaps all in one big center that might share a big auditorium and a variety of other things for greater efficiency of use. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, but it was that, that real anxiety that without that kind of support that our, our history, our arts, and our culture will vanish from this town. Mm -hmm.